So does everybody know the word placemaking? Is that a familiar word? So to none people? of you know the word placemaking. So who's, who knows so, the word placemaking? Great. Okay, so, uh, so it's, it's a very kind of cobbled together word that we, we didn't make up. A lot of people made it up. Um, but it's a word that means uh, the process of creating a good place. And so, for example, this place, uh, Stelka, is a good place, I think. I mean, it's a good, yeah, there's a lot of things to do. You have food, you have entertainment, you have education. So that's one example of a good place. Um, although it's, it's so, I mean, in, it's, uh, Gorky Park is another example of a good place. So I've, I've, this is the, the um, definition that we use in our office, but I'd like to just add a couple of things about it. I think, it's a, it, I think the important is that it's a human function. It's something that um, is, belongs to the community. It belongs to um, everyone. It's not any, everybody can do it. It's easy to do. Um, so it's a functional uh, play thing to do. It's, and it's, in, it's a, in some ways a, a act of liberation. I don't know what that means exactly, but it means where you have the freedom to do where, what you want to do. For example, in a good park, you, uh, you have the freedom to sit or relax or eat. Or, so it's a, it's, a, it's a liberation in that sense. Um, it is also uh, the word uh, staking claim. I think that means it means it's a way of getting involved. So, for example, if you all were involved in Stelka in some way, that's a way of getting involved in creating a good place. Um, so it's staking claim. It's that's not what I would use that word, but um, it's also beautification. I mean, even though this place is not. Maybe some people might consider it really beautiful. Other people would say it's very comfortable. I love to be here. But maybe it's not beautiful, um, to some people's think. So in, in a sense, it's really empowerment. So you are able to do, you can take on what you need. That's all. OK. So. So it's, so like I just said, it's a community process, a natural, it, it's a local process. It's not, it's not about every place, it's about one place. So for the, the waterfront in Moscow, along the, uh, the Moscow River, that's a place. It's not the whole of Moscow is a beautiful, or it's a not a uh, place. Um, it's one, one place. That's, that's how we view it. So it's economic development, for sure. It's scaled to each community. So it's not a scale of, um, for a whole city or a whole region. It's a community scale. It's also um, that scale creates kind of social ca capital um, for any community. So it has a lot of potential. So it, it, and it has, you know, its outcomes are, it's healthy places, um, it's uh, sustainable places, viable places, you know, there's a lot of out outcomes. So these are the, uh, about 20 years ago, we decided after working for 20 years at Project for Public Spaces, we decided we should, um, Write, somebody asked us to write a book about um, how to do, how to create a good place. And we, do we have a copy? No, we don't have it. It's, it's in our office, and it's um, in the office. But these are the underlying principles. So we wrote that 20 years ago, and now we've rewritten it and adding new case studies, new tools, new... So it's really a handbook of tools and case studies. It's not, you know, it's not, well, I shouldn't say, it's not a brilliant book, but it's a, it's a really good book for people. It, it is people. brilliant. It is brilliant, believe me. <laughs> she wrote well, it. So, well, no, I did not write it. There you did, most of it. I, well, We're sorry. married. Sort of, but... <laughs> 
Um, okay, so the, the main thing about a good place and the underlying idea of all of our work is the community is the expert of, of that, on, at that place or about that place. The community is the expert in here, right around this, say, five blocks area. This is the community is the expert, not us, not the designer, not the government, not the, um, uh, the church um, or the cathedral. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, um, it's the community of all those people, we feel, but it's not anybody's place. It's everybody's place of that, in that area. So, um, and it's different from a design process. It's a, a place-driven place process. It's not, a, you know, there's a program for a place which is um, a des usually a, is considered a design program. We, we try to create, with the community, a program of the uses that would go on in that place so that the designers can um, implement those uh, ideas that the community has. That's our kind of, uh, I don't know, that's what we stand for, I guess you'd say. And so you, can't, you can do it alone, definitely. Um, you cannot do it alone um, because all these people in this community, the cathedral, uh, Stelka, Strelka, the um, office buildings, the um, other people in this industrial area. So everybody has to work, work together in a, in, to have a successful place. That's what we found. If you have somebody, some organization that comes top down and says, okay, here's the plan for this industrial district, that, that really won't work is what we have found. Um, it needs to be kind of bottom up versus top-down. Um, and then we have a, I don't know if anyone have, has uh, heard of this baseball player, New York Yankee baseball player. His name is Yogi Berra, and he has all kinds of quips about um, public space, everything. Like he said, um, uh, let's see, what are the, what's the one of, if they say it can't be done, um, that's what I, um, it doesn't always work out that way. So it's kind of like a, kind of a, tour, a, a, a funny to uh, use, or you say, people, um, it's so busy in this place, nobody comes here anymore. And so it's, he has these crazy things, a whole book of these things they call yogis or yogiisms. Anyway, that's what, it all, every, in so many communities, people will say, um, oh, we can't uh, narrow the roadway along the waterfront. We've already done that. So um, he would say, it, it's, it, it can be done. It, if you, you never can say it can't be done. And then you say, oh, could you have um, uh, this, this facility? Probably a lot of people said no before somehow someone said yes. Um, so it's always, um, the government often will um, say, okay, we have a rule, you can't, we have, this had it in, in New York, that, that not one time, it said, you cannot eat in a park. And so it's like, what? You cannot eat in a park. That was the rule in, the, in many parks in New York City. I don't know if you have that rule. Or, Somebody said, oh, you, we're going to have a, a, a market, and it's going to include um, uh, chess tables. And so that then it would say, they would say, um, that is not allowed. Gaming is not allowed. So things like that. So our, we have several um, tools that are communicated in this book and in our work. And one is, is observing. We have a lot of, um, uh, Fred will explain all of those techniques in the sort of second part of, what, part of his, his presentation. And then the, a placemaking plan versus different of a, from a, a program for a, a place. It's a placemaking plan, not a master plan. So Fred will explain that. And then we have a, uh, and then 
how do you translate an idea into action? And one is the idea of triangulation, and that is um, how you combine various things in a public space so they all work together. Um, so there are five things in one place, so they're not all uh, uh, strewn around. So what we do, we have, Fred will show examples, case studies of things like Harvard Square in, in, um, in uh, Boston, in Cambridge, and he'll show uh, Perry Plage in Paris and in um, uh, Detroit, Michigan. So all these will be examples of these kinds of translating ideas into action. And then what very important one is uh, what we call lighter, quicker, cheaper, which is, means very important, uh, kind of an overarching principle of what we have um, espoused, I guess, which is do something quickly, experiment, evaluate, get people to work, work together, have, have people, come, the community come up with ideas, and then um, go to the next step, but not wait for a long time um, before anything happens. So it's lighter, quicker, cheaper. Lighter, quicker, cheaper. Um, and then money is not the issue. Maybe you will think, oh, it's, it's too expensive. And it's the, it not, the money is not the issue we found. The money is that, I mean, the uh, issue is it's probably not the right idea anyway. So it's not the money, just so, you know, like block, remove that from your mind, and then um, and then you're never finished. You know, constantly. You know, you will never, never, never finish a public space because 90% of a good public space um, has due to its management. So I think the next one thing. So these are the places we've worked over the last uh, 43 years, and we did a lot of different types of, not design program, or, or we, it's, it might be education, implementation, all the, most of the projects that Fred is going to show, we have been involved in in some way. And I think that's the next one. So, wow, this is a real treat. Uh, I am 75 years old. Uh, in 1970, I organized Earth Day in New York City, and we had a picture of well over a million people on the cover of the New York Times that went global. Uh, but it was really interesting. It was fake news, because I'm sure only about 10 people knew it was Earth Day. They found out about it the next day in the newspaper. And that's kind of what's happened to placemaking. Placemaking is a uh, extremely deep value to people. And as they realize what it means, it becomes more and more part of their life and their aspiration and how they can move forward in a, in a, in a world that's more about the places they can be in and want to be in. So it's really a paradigm shift. Uh, so, uh, uh, if architecture is frozen music and urban planning is composition, placemaking is improvisational street performance. So as you look at all of the, the stuff I'm going to show you, everything is about improvisation. And what we're, all, what we're saying is we don't know what's going to come out of the people in a community, but it's always a lot of wisdom, it's a lot of good ideas, and you try them, and they shape the future of their place, whether it's you know, whether it's uh, a neighborhood street, whether it's even a school ground or a library, all of these things are up for grabs. They can be redefined totally. We don't even use the word park anymore because a park has a connotation of just being green and open space. But a, but a square has a connotation of having uh, green and having markets, having games, having all kinds of things. So everything sort of is merging to where it's a kind of a multi-use type of place. Like a library. If you think a library is a building in the future, it's going to be much more than a building. It's going to be maybe a market, a playground, uh, whatever you think it can be. But it's no longer just a building. So what is the architecture of the future? It's a very different kind of architecture as we move forward. 
So I have to tell you that two of my grandchildren are Russian, and two of them, the two of them speak Russian and English. One is three and the other is five. Uh, but when she heard we were going to Russia, one of the, the youngest one, she locked herself in the bathroom and took her mother's lipstick and put it all over her face with the idea that she would go to Russia. So we have a very strong fondness, fa familiar fondness with, uh, with Russia. And uh, so we're, this is a, a real pleasure for us. The other thing that's really great from my point of view is everyone in our office is between 30, 25, and 40. So I, as long as I don't look at myself in the mirror, I don't see someone who's older. So I am living my life through those people and that together we can kind of do something where maybe I have some wisdom or Kathy and they have the passion and the creativity. So to see all of you in that wonderful age where you can define the future is really fantastic. And that's what's going on around the world. We, we're very close to UN Habitat and uh, what they're looking at is how, what is the city of the future? Uh, to me, the city of the future is very different than the city we're living in today. Every city, your city, our city. We live in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so it's very exciting to begin to see what that future might be. And I'm going to show you uh, a lot of really good examples. So place and placemaking really has a big impact. It can mobilize communities. Uh, it helps people define their future, adds purpose and foundation to people's lives. One of the biggest issues in, in, in every community is people are lonely, they're isolated, they're not connected uh, because of the way the designs are, the streets. They're not public spaces, they're for cars, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a paradigm shift, a really fundamental shift in the way we live and the way we want to live in the future. So that creates ownership. As soon as you feel like you own something, you feel more vested in that. And you don't have to physically own it or financially own it. It can be your part of your place. And it supports innovation. Uh, Placemaking and innovation are totally woven together. Uh, and it's that creativity that it kind of emerges as people become vested in their community. And it also allows local wisdom. Uh, and it's holistic, it's inclusive, and so on and so forth. So uh, what we're doing is we're leading a global placemaking campaign. And what Kathy is talking about is we start with making the places better, but then we move toward, then we have this large movement that's going on globally. And people uh, have signed up for something called a placemaking leadership council. Is anyone here signed up for that? Well, go on our website and sign up, but there are 2,000 people on it all over the world. And then we're looking at systemic change. Everything needs to change fundamentally. The way we design our buildings, the way we think of our streets, the way we think of our public spaces. Uh, and the whole world needs to be turned upside down to get it right side up, to get from my point of view, our point of view, to get from inadequate to extraordinary. So the future is extremely bright uh, with this kind of uh, movement that's defined by placemaking. So these are the people around the world that are doing that. So uh, the person I worked with was a mentor, uh, was William White. And he was, uh, he was a great observer, a writer. I never had lunch with him in all the time I worked with him because that was the time we'd go out and study the social life of small spaces. Uh, and he had this way of writing. It's hard to create a place that will not attract people what is remarkable is how often that has been accomplished. And you can see that wherever you go. I saw a lot of that here in Moscow. I also saw some very good places. But there are too many places that are just places you look at and you don't touch. Uh, and those are the ones that need to have a different future. Uh, if you want to see a place with activity, put out food. Uh, ice cream. We love to sit watching people eat ice cream because they'll all eat in unison. One of them is about french fries. So you really get to see the life of a place around an ice cream stand or around food. Uh, and this is a, an amazing picture because uh, if you look at it, uh, there's only one person that does not have ice cream. And, uh, <laughs> and so 
I, I couldn't believe this picture because I'm sure it's never happened anywhere in the world that one person, a little kid, would not have ice cream. So I took the next picture uh, and he looked at me and he must have known that I knew he didn't ha wasn't having ice cream, but everyone else is. Uh, and then, uh, you know, one of the best things about water is the look and feel of it. It's not right to put water before people and not let them touch it. Uh, and. Uh, you know, you can't stay away from something like this. And you've got some wonderful water features here in Moscow, or that, or that. I mean, this is just blew, blew us away, how incredibly wonderful on a hot day in Paris, the kids just full of joy walking, running through that space. Oops. So inventions are artifacts, the purpose of which is to punctuate architectural photographs. They are not so good for sitting. You have a lot of those architectural icons in your public spaces that are not so good for sitting. So a nine foot bench is very different than a four foot bench. Uh, a movable seating like this in a city in, in uh, Germany where even when it rains, people put their umbrellas up. Or this bench uh, which is probably the best bench ever designed. There are probably 18 people there, and each is there small groups of people all clustered. And it's fun to sit on a bench like that because a lot of people are listening to what other people are saying. Uh, and then this one, this is Paris, and uh, Paris is a, is a city of lovers. Uh, and so this didn't really phase anyone else there, but it really looked like a, a pretty good show. And affection. Affection is really, it's so much, so different. It's not just kissing, but it's touching, it's looking. When you walk down a street in a good place, you'll be looking at other people's eyes. And it's that you talk to people with your eyes. And that's a form of affection. Uh, and so good places, it's very, people are affectionate in so many ways uh, that are so interesting. So these are three generations of women sitting on a bench that someone donated in a small town in California. And if, this is a world record of people taking their shoes off. Good public spaces, people take their shoes off. So these are the metrics that we're talking about. You know, the data, we, everyone wants more data. Well, if 30% if of the people take their shoes off, you know it's a pretty good place. And, you know, when you're sitting in a, I mean, you can't get better than this, just rubbing your dog's stomach with, and then this is actually a library. It's on the banks of the, of the Seine in Paris. Uh, and people are out there reading books. And then this is a museum uh, on the banks of the Seine in Paris. So, when you start thinking about what you can do along the waterfront here, you do not have a very good waterfront. <laughs> I don't need to tell you that, but this is one of the more boring waterfronts with traffic, heavy traffic going along it. So th what that means, it's one of the biggest opportunities. And what they've done in Paris, they've taken the traffic off of the roads going th along the waterfront. So there's a big idea here that needs to be taken on and you all should take that on and get your waterfront back uh, so that it can be usable again. Oops. So, uh, we, we were in, we, what our goal, Kathy's and my goal is to uh, look at these small urban spaces and see how they function. So this was one that was really quite uh, revelation to us. The, the picture on the uh, upper left is this tree with a tree guard around it. But what happens when people come to open up the, the, the uh, drinking, the, the juice bar and the, the soup kitchen is someone puts out the bench, this kind of rickety old bench. Uh, every day they put it out and they take, and then they take it out at night. We don't know who does that, 
But that little place then becomes a gathering place where people who are getting a drink talk to each other while another one's getting a drink, where the soup is over there in the seating, uh, and people are watching uh, there, and the, and the soup is right there. Uh, it's a, it's a, a place where people stop. There's lots of people going by. And, uh, and those women are just re casually relaxing. So that little bench, you can't design it better, uh, but it is certainly one of the, the most rickety things I've ever seen. But something like that works. That's a place. So how do we find places like that or create places like that is really a big challenge. So that goes back to the improvisation. Uh, and so when you focus on place, you do everything differently. And so making it happen, so this is how we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to get this to happen. And we've done this all over the world. Uh, the first part is a dot exercise. Uh, and, and then the power of 10. So the dot exercise is you take a, an area like this, this happens to be in Atlanta, and we give 30 to 50 people a green dot, a yellow dot, and a red dot. Now you can do this in a neighborhood, you can do it in a downtown, you can do it along a main street, you can do it along the waterfront. Uh, and so these people all put their dots on this map. And it really blew them away because the yellow dots are places with a big opportunity, the red dots are bad places, and the green dots are good places. So all of these yellow dots along here is the main street. It's Peachtree Street in Atlanta, which is the most important street for the whole city. And it's not functioning. It has a big opportunity, but it's not functioning. And the little green dots right here is on a small street where there are a lot of restaurants. So the people who lived in that place and owned the properties did not think it was very good. But when they do something like this, or you do it in your neighborhood or your community, you can have a big impact because people will realize what's not working and what they need to do. And then you can actually circle areas and say these are our, our main targets to work on. So the community is the expert. They choose, they make their own assessment of what they have, and then they choose where to work. And so you're now ready to go forward and make something happen in that place. So we're not, the, we're not the experts, we're a great resource, but we're not the experts, they are. And they now know what they wanna do as they move forward. So the power of 10, this is New York City, and uh, we worked on the most important spaces in New York City, which I'll show you. Uh, but when we started working in 1975, none of these were good spaces. Uh, but we took on and did the most important spaces in New York, uh, and uh, so the whole idea of having the power of 10 is a great city, Moscow, needs 10 great destinations. And each of those destinations, you need 10 places, and in each place you need 10 things to do. So it's 10 times 10 times 10. So this isn't how it looks, this is how it functions. So you have a lot of these new designs that really don't function very well because they're not, there's not things to do. You look at them, but you don't participate. And I can explain some of them to you that we saw. But the whole idea is to move out of the design-led projects to the place-led where it's about the uses. It actually requires more design to do that. And we'll show you that. So one of the places we worked on was Rockefeller Center. Uh, when we started working, they asked us what kind of spikes to put on the ledges, and we said benches. Uh, they did, and uh, the place became a major destination. The value of the property went up. It became one of the main destinations in New York. But when we started working, it was basically a ghost town. And they took out the parking. This is really great. They took out the parking and put an auction house in there because it was more valuable to them as an institution or a company to not have parking. It didn't really do much for them. So then Bryant Park, uh, there, were, there were nine groups of peop people dealing in drugs in Bryant Park. Uh, and uh, so this is the report we did, intimidation or recreation. Uh, so there's nine groups, you know, like 90 people dealing in drugs in that park. 
And, uh, and this is what it looked like. And today, it looks like that. And uh, the before and after uh, was phenomenal. The drug dealing was right up those stairs. And we put other kinds of drugs. We put uh, ice cream and coffee right here uh, and up there so that people would go and get food. We didn't lose any jobs. Uh, we kept the level of employment. We just changed what they were doing. And so the, the power of 10, so the power of 10, this is like the power of 20. So if you take each one of these places, there are 10 things to do in each of those places. So you can go there 10 times and do 40 different things. So that's what drives people there, draws them there, and it spreads them out throughout that whole place. There'll be movies. Uh, you know. So people play chess, and in the wintertime they have a skating rink there and all kinds of, of activity that people can take part in. Uh, and that's the winter power of 10. So if people will say you can't do anything in the winter, we don't buy that. This is as busy in the winter as it is in the summer. So and then Times Square, we did some of the first planning for Times Square where it was like that. And then uh, it became that, that, and then. And then Detroit was probably our biggest success story. All New York, it took us you know, 30 years to get those paces really functioning. In Detroit, it only took four years. So Detroit, uh, in 1919, looked like this. It was a very important city because it was the automobile center and it was fully recognized globally as one of the most important cities in the United States. In 1999, that statue did not move at all, but everything else around it was taken out. It was a big Woody's department store, and uh, that's when we got started, and we did a plan, uh, a Power of Ten plan for the city, for that whole downtown area, and, uh, and these are the destinations that we had to get 10 times 10 uses in them. Uh, and this is the timeline because Campus Martius, this is the, the, the vision for Campus Martius is right here in the middle. And then we implemented that, or was implemented. Uh, and, uh, and then the next thing, this is what it was like in 2013. And uh, we were asked to do a placemaking plan as an upgrade because we're never finished. Uh, and so uh, we uh, did that. So here's the announcement. We announced the plan uh, in March 31st of 2013, and we implemented the plan by June. So we did a lighter, quicker, cheaper. And this guy has bought all of the uh, almost the entire downtown. He owns the Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, but his whole passion is about bringing Detroit back. So he is the power behind it, but his whole, he, he is what we call a zealous nut who doesn't know what he can't do, and so he has other people doing things. He, he respects everyone who has innovative ideas. They allow them to happen, and the whole place has taken off in a, in a record time of three to four years. So. Uh, these are the plans, uh, and this is what happened. This is what we implemented. And we implemented part of the center of Detroit. We put a beach right in the center, right here. And that was done in the same month that Detroit declared bankruptcy. So the success of this was phenomenal, but it was all improvisation. We didn't know what we were going to do next. We tried things out. and. Uh, but it brought everyone in the whole community, in the region, down to the, to the center of Detroit. Uh, and the games, uh, all of this is temporary. And it was temporary in the beginning and it gradually took on a, a higher level of design uh, and games. And uh, Dan Gilbert is there playing music with a, one of the local jazz people. So it was very collective, very, uh, 
engaging. They put a beer garden right next to the, to the uh, beach. Uh, and, uh, and then there's uh, exercises on, on the grass. But everyone comes because it's their place. So that, this is placemaking at its best. But there's actually more design in this than there would be if you designed a new series of mounds and trees because it's so complex and so interesting. So, and then even taking these old office buildings uh, and adding something to it in the, in the front gives that a whole new life. So uh, nothing is sacred uh, when it comes to placemaking. You can do these kinds of things very easily. So this is the, the matrix after that. Uh, and the thing about placemaking is it's really about daily activation. Sure, you have weekly programming, seasonal and special events, but it has to work every day of the year, morning, noon, and night. So uh, implementation. Lighter, quicker, cheaper, one to four months. That's long term is two years. We don't think beyond two years, really a year, because you really got to get things to happen. You create these energetic anchors of activity. Uh, you crowdsource ideas. You make it of a movable feast. You get life on the streets and the walkways. Uh, and you bring the inside out. So a lot of your retail here, you can't tell what's going on. It's sort of behind the wall, so to speak. And so the whole concept of bringing the retail out uh, is very important. So another project that really has, I think, a lot of resonance here, uh, this is Market Square in Pittsburgh uh, that we were brought in to, to fix. And you break that down into uh, 12 different places, and we developed a program for each of those places. Uh, and, uh, and you can see uh, each, each quadrant has its own, and they have a, a nighttime and a wintertime program uh, for that. And then you implement it, and that's the foundation. And then uh, this is sort of the daily activity, and you have a quality of a good square as the inner and the outer square all have to work together. Uh, you can't isolate something in the middle and not let that work. So, uh, and this is one of their events. So it's become the center of, of Pittsburgh. And what's happened is because it's so strong, all the other areas around it also become strong. So it's a catalyst for the transformation of Pittsburgh, which everyone now recognizes as pretty amazing. So, and then the lighter, ch quicker, cheaper, this is our favorite thing, and the person who did uh, Gabrielle's Wharf in London is uh, the person that came up with that phrase, uh, because he uh, took this building, uh, the back of a building, and he uh, painted it. That's all paint. That's not a, that's not a building, it's paint. So that became that, became that. And then he put small garage structures in the bottom of it. And this is 40 years ago. And he created 60 jobs, all local, to, local entrepreneurs. And it's become a destination in three months. It became, what? It was a parking lot. So you can, so this, you can do this. This is, you know, that's a lighter, lighter quick, quicker, cheaper. Uh, and then his partner, another friend of ours, did a market in Brooklyn using containers. And we all know about, you know, uh, street, uh, uh, food trucks and that kind of stuff. But he would create these, these act, active activity areas where people would dance and so on. Uh, and uh, this became an overnight success. The developer who owned the property had so much attention on the property, he started developing it. So this had to move uh, somewhere else. Uh, but it, it, it's, you know, a great gathering place. So and then Harvard University. Um, Harvard's a very hard place to work because there's an architecture school called the Graduate School of Design. I, I will not make an advertisement for, for hiring anyone from the GSD because it's all about form. And we had a really hard time making a place at Harvard. So uh, be careful of who you try to hire from there. 
So we worked, uh, we're working on Harvard Square, which is on the left, and then uh, Harvard Yard, and then this plaza right here. And uh, this is Harvard Yard. Uh, for 350 years, this is what Harvard Yard looked like. And then one day, these chairs were put out. That was a game changer. It totally changed everything. And you can't believe what happened. I mean, people just immediately fell in love with it. And, you know, some people were stunned. But it was just what had to happen. Uh, and then this, so then we started working on this space, which was just totally empty. Uh, it's really the center of the whole campus. And, uh, and this landscape urbanist, don't hire landscape urbanists because they'll give you something like this with uh, benches like that. Now those, he thought they were absolutely the most ergonomic, wonderfully functional benches that could have ever been designed. Uh, we had to, uh, so this is what we did because that, this has now become a place because we programmed it with all kinds of uses. And then uh, we had to bring bean bags out so that we, he, people could use the benches. So you can sit on, as long as you have a bean bag, you can sit on it. So this is the design led versus the place led that uh, we get involved in all the time. But this became the center of Harvard and Cambridge. Uh, and it's, it goes year round uh, and it's uh, a place. And what happens here is that people start to find a place that they would like to do something in. If they have a hobby or something they'd like to exhibit or something to do, they can come and do it here. That's what a, a, a good public space is, is. It's open and available for people to do things uh, that are spontaneous, that are, uh, that, you know, that are improvisation. And this is a very high level. One of the economics professors was walking through there and someone asked us, well, how do you, how do you uh, get data on this? And he said, well, it's the number of times I run into someone else. So he comes there with the idea of running into someone else and then other people come. So it's become the center of people's lives on a college campus like, uh, like Harvard. And so you, we broke that down into 14 places and we uh, developed a program for each of them. And that is the beginning, but the end is nowhere near in sight. But it has become an absolute essential place in the campus. And then us to us, this may be the best public space anywhere in the world. It's in Paris, it's in a neighborhood, mostly immigrant neighborhood. Uh, and it is just amazing. Uh, it, we didn't have anything to do with it, uh, but we were just there f uh, last week, and it is just full of amazing impromptu, improvisation uh, ideas. Uh, it's three months during the summer, and they take it out, uh, and every year they bring it back, and it gets better. Uh, they have a, a big swimming hole, uh, and these are images from last year, uh, and uh, that image there. So you can see how crude it is, but how functional it is. So that gives you the foundation for what it can become over time in the future. Uh, and come on. There. And seating is, is a cr critical part of that. So streets, uh, you have a, you've done some wonderful stuff on your streets in terms of taking parking lots out uh, around the green, uh, what do they call that, the green, what's the, the big road? That road is terrible. <laughs> you can't cross it. <laughs> That's just amazing. I've never been in a city where you can't cross the main streets. Uh, but what's happened on the side and the sidewalks that have been widened is fantastic. So that's the first step. That's the foundation for what can go on from there. And if you think of that whole uh, road system and you think about the power of 10 
and you come up with 10 destinations with 10 places and 10 things to do instead of these grass mounds, you will end up with destinations that people want to come to. And that's a critical part of the future. So the big part, you're at stage one uh, of something that ought to be a four or five stage process. So you're at the beginning uh, for us coming from another place in the world and we see it and we say, oh wow, your opportunity's here, but you haven't done anywhere near what you need to do to get it to the next level. So the whole concept of, of, of streets as places, this is a uh, bookstore in our neighborhood in Brooklyn and there are at least 10 things to do as you come along and go by the bookstore. Well, you need 10 of those stores on our street, which we have, uh, to be able to do that. And so when you design your community or city around cars and traffic, you get more cars and traffic. But when you design your, com your community around people and places, uh, you'll get more people and places. It's pretty obvious. But who is doing that? You're the people who have to do it. Government isn't set up. The, the, there's no discipline in placemaking. Uh, it's a community engagement, activation, ownership process. It's not a design process. So this is also in our neighborhood in Brooklyn. And these are not benches. The, they're not benches, OK? Uh, you're, not, uh, you're not allowed to put benches like this on the street. So they call them tree guards. They protect the tree. Uh, but people can sit on them. Uh, and even, even a dog can have a place on that bench. So getting the right kind of amenities, the right kind of amenities is really critical uh, to help double load a sidewalk. Uh, and I'm, I think I should go a little faster. No, I'm okay? Okay. So, <laughs> I, I don't want to bore, bore you, but you know, the biggest deal are streets. So you can take a street like this, which was the center of town in Holland, uh, and this traffic engineer uh, made it that. He turned it into that because, and he made it safer by doing that. So, and there's no stoplights. So people come in, what? There are no stop signs and no stoplights. So people come to the intersection and, uh, and they, they create eye contact. His whole goal as a traffic engineer was to create eye contact uh, with the, between the vehicle and the pedestrian and the bicyclist. So the accident rates went down after this happened. And we were standing there with a person who did this and a bus driver came up, stopped his bus, opened the door and said to Mr. Monderman, thank you, you have made my life so much better by doing what he did. So he did it in 153 communities all, all across uh, northern Holland in varying ways. This was the most impressive one. So, and then we have a, a, a heavy duty traffic engineer on our staff and, uh, and another intersection in that town uh, we put them out in the middle, in the center of the street, because there's, there were no stop signs or lights. So he stood there, and uh, a truck came along, and he was fine. So then we said, well, wait a minute, let's try a little bore. Let's put him in a chair in the middle of the intersection. Uh, and he's still alive. Uh, so if you want vehicles to behave like they're in a village, you build a village. Uh, and essentially what that means is a transfer power from the state to the individual and the community. So this is a paradigm shift and there's no road that I've ever seen that can't be modified or modulated to make it more pedestrian friendly. And one of the things that we find as we wander around the world, um, whoops, what happened? I guess I don't have it there. Uh, so I, I don't have that, so I'm skipping that. Uh, so uh, Christopher Alexander is an architect, and he did something called pattern language. And uh, he, he said this, and I kind of agree with him. I don't want to hear about green buildings anymore. It's just simply an extension of technocratic society. So last year, we gave a talk to the Green Building Association, 
because they wanted to know what they could do beyond just making a green building to making a, a building fit into a community. Uh, so it was pretty good. And then this is something that he said, and I, I'm going to end with this, but people are deeply nourished by the process of creating wholeness. And that means your, your life has to, in a sense, be satisfying, supportive, engaging, connected. Uh, you, your aspirations can be played out. You share with people in the community. That's the goal that people have. We all have those goals wherever we live. And when we get to those places, regardless of, I mean, I don't think rich people have as big an opportunity to do that as just normal people. Uh, and especially poor, poor and low income people that can have that kind of nurturing uh, in healthy places. So we actually work with the International Rescue uh, uh, Group that my other daughter-in-law works for. Uh, so the, the, all, all of the, the, uh, the United, what are they, refugees coming to various countries, are, we work with many of them to create a sense of place where they're coming so that they're connected to their. So the whole idea of architecture of place, uh, this is something that I've been very passionate about Sure, is the building sustainable? Does it minimize its impact? Does it use the most ecological materials? Does it, does it celebrate nature? But you should also ask the questions, does the building and project generate life? Uh, does it support its context? The built cultural, historical, social, economic place context, does it support people in their comfort? And is it human scale? We have very good friends who are the biggest developers in Brazil and what they're saying is, we're not going to let architects design the bottom three floors. We're going to leave that up to people who understand the street life. So taking that out of the architecture profession, they're still designers, but they're more storefront designers, industrial designers that can make the ground floor of a, of a building come to life. So this is a building in Melbourne. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement. It's sustainable. Uh, it has a roof deck, and then the whole ground level of that building is alive uh, with uses. And then our favorite place in the world that we, uh, well, it's pretty good. It's amazing. It's a hospital, and we did a lot of training in Singapore, and the head of the hospital construction uh, came to our training, and when he finished this hospital, he got us to come back to Singapore and showed us around uh, because he had taken the placemaking concept, the idea of the power of 10, of, of, the, of the, the, the layering of uses. Uh, and it was really quite remarkable what he was able to do. Uh, so this is him. And, uh, and this is the setting that they created, uh, this courtyard looking out over uh, a, a water feature. And here, what he did is he said, we want 100 different kinds of plants, 100 different kinds of butterflies, 100 different kinds of birds. Uh, and the whole place has to feel like it's part of the community and it's part of nature uh, and, and place. Uh, and so he took us all around the place. And uh, I had one of my epiphanies there. This is the water feature. And uh, they're, they're the, the butterflies that they'd sighted at that point in time. Uh, and this is the community uh, food center, which is part of the hospital, but it's also part of the community uh, and serves all healthy foods. And uh, these are the various rooms. But the thrill, I mean, the, this was a, a room where people were in the last days of their lives. And it was open air, it was and even in the hot weather. And I looked around and I thought this was, what a wonderful place to end your life in something that was just felt so wonderful. Because the next room I went to was this room, a private room. And I said, I would never want to die in here. I'd much rather die out there, because that had feeling of life and health to it. This has a feeling of isolation and, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to die. No, no, I'm not planning to. And then the roof was a, was a, a farmer's garden. And this is the, the toilets. 
So it was, the building was a hassle-free experience. And that's the way a hospital should be. Not just a hospital, but a school should be that way, or you know, all of our buildings should be that way. So uh, the characteristics of great public spaces, you know, good places breed healthy activity. There's a tremendous uh, impact a good place has on people's lives. The biggest disease out there is isolation uh, and, and depression. And so these places, the amount of money putting it, you put into making places healthy and, and alive is infinitesimal to what it costs in terms of health costs. And then people attract people, attract people. When you focus on place, you do everything differently. Uh, it takes a community, it takes many disciplines and skills to create a place. It is not one silo. That is, that is a dead end uh, solution. And it takes a community to create a place. Uh, amenities that make a place comfortable are critical. Uh, you can't know what you're going to end up with. And if you think you have to, you're wrong. Uh, each place has its own identity. You can't have anything less than excellence. To me, every time I look at that, I say, my god, if we don't have places that people can live in, in a healthy uh, way, we're not doing them any service. We're denying their future. We're mitigating against the, the potential that they have. We're taking it away from people. So it has to be a campaign. And this is where the movement comes back in. You know, you need to develop a vision. Uh, you become communicators of it. Search for impediments. Organize a team. Attack complacency. Produce short-term wins. Uh, take on bigger challenges and then connect change uh, to the culture of that community. So these are the people that do it. And we are absolutely locked in to people that are like this. They are visionaries with a poorly developed sense of fear and no concept of the odds against them. They make the impossible happen. And they're in every community everywhere. And those are the people that make change. Uh, and those are the people that are part of our leadership council they had, to, uh, they had to fill out a, uh, an application and they had to admit that they were zealous nuts. So they are all zealous nuts and there are 2,000 of them around the world. And that's where we believe the future is and the future is you all uh, because if you are zealous nuts, which you probably are to come here, you won't know what you can't do. And if you think that way, you'll be able to do so much more than you ever thought you could do. And uh, that's been our life. And the people that we've worked with around the world are the most amazing people. And the future is extremely bright for them. And just, this is just a little bit of a sidebar, but place, enhancing place, has an impact on all of these areas, on equity, on design, on culture, on climate change, on local food systems, on transportation, preservation, public health. A good place has an impact on all of those. It doesn't replace preservation. It, it enhances the use of preservation and so on. Now, I, I'm so sorry about this, but I'll just read little bits because this is so important. These are a group of developers that got together and what we're talking about are public multi-use destinations. So a park is a public multi-use destination. A school is a multi-use destination. Uh, it's no longer just a school building, but it's a, a lot of things to people. And those are what, what people found were the most successful. The more dimensions there was to a particular type of facility, the more successful it was. Like the hospital that I showed you. That was a community facility, not just a hospital. And they made sure it was woven into that community. And then this, these are the developers, a big 50 developers, really prominent ones, who said, don't lead with design. Yes, don't lead with design. Lead with a program of uses and develop a program as you build a building that is lighter, quicker, cheaper in terms of activations, and then gradually get to where the design functions as people move in, and then you've got a successful future, you're spending less money and you're providing something in the, with people who come there to make it their own. And then the importance of government learning to say yes. Government is the most difficult of all because government is defined by silos. 
So the whole idea of governance is a big part of the future of cities, that we have to take the silos out and imagine having a department of placemaking and having the traffic engineers report to the department of placemaking. That would be a paradigm shift. And the building department report to the placemaking people. And the people in placemaking would be a lot of you, you all who would, in a sense, guide the future of Moscow or the cities you're from uh, to create this sustainable sense of place. Uh, and so if you think you're done, you're finished. That's, you've done, you're done, and you're never go any, you'll never get anywhere because you're finished. Uh, so that just says you, you don't stop. It's really the beginning of a place. And then the magic is in the mix. And I like this because uh, you, the mixed use, you build authentic places through establishing settings and uses that are intimately related, interconnected, and interdependent. True sustainability comes from the relationships between uses, tenants, and the organizations within a place. So find creative funding strategies to keep rents low, attract a range of tenants with innovation, lighter, quicker, cheaper solutions. So that's the kind of, from a, a group of developers, that's what they came up with after a three-day developers meeting we did. And, and I think that's the wisdom that we'd like to pass on to you is it's a very different world out there in the future. Uh, and in order to get to the kind of place of wholeness that we all want to be, we have to know that that's what's going to nourish our future and our neighbors and our city and our country and the world. And that's what's going to make it a better place. So this is a grassroots movement. We're being invited to work in Saudi Arabia for the whole, the whole country of Saudi Arabia uh, because they want to move back to where their communities were naturally open uh, processes of men and women <laughs> working, living together. It's only when the cars came in and they started getting isolated that the kind of conservative movement got a hold and, and forced them into the situation they're in. They see placemaking as a way out of that, a natural, organic way out, and they just started, the women just started driving. So anyway, this is what we do, and uh, we're really proud to be here. Uh, we cannot believe what a wonderful gathering you've all been part of here to come and hear. We really appreciate it. Uh, Moscow has a tremendous future. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Большое спасибо. А теперь у нас есть немного времени, буквально на несколько вопросов Фреду и Кэти. Вы можете поднимать руку, девушки в зале к вам подойдут. Вопросы можно задавать по-русски. Перед этим, пожалуйста, представьтесь. Hi everyone, my name is Ekaterina and I will ask the question in English. Um, thank you for an amazing presentation and your visit of Moscow and I know you will travel to, to St. Petersburg. Yeah, I can stand like this as well. Uh, I have a question about the future because um, all your examples are related to, to today's reality, to past reality where people uh, used to spend their time physically with the families, with the kids, with the pets, but now that time is changing and people spend more and more time in the iPhones, in um, smartphones, uh, in, in omni-channel and um, social media and all that trendy words, you know. Um, what do you think about the future, how meeting places will change and how people's behavior is changing and what does it mean for the place? Thank you. So, so, so when you go to a, you, when you go to a really it's a great question. When you go to a really great place, and you watch people in great places, and you'll see that they are looking mostly at other people doing stuff, and every so often they look down like that, and they're looking around. You know, it's sort of like that. When you go to a bad place, they're like this. They're like sitting like this, just looking at it. They're oblivious. 
So the better the place, the more interaction they're having with their friends through the social media. And in fact, their friends are now being told what they're doing. Uh, so that's the positive side. And so the better the places you have, the better connections people have all around. Well, he does look at his cell phone all the time, continually. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm the worst, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm the worst in terms of I never bring my cell phone into public space. Um, but I think that, I think what he's saying about the, the, um, the more interesting places and there are things to watch, like little, you know, little kids that are climbing on something, you've, like in the, uh, the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris, people are just uh, glued, their eyes are glued to the, the uh, kids. And then, well, just in the museum, with the, the fountain in the museum, I mean, people are just, hardly anybody was in the, the, uh, in, on their cell phone uh, two days ago. Right? Did you feel yes. that? The more interesting places, the uh, less you need to be somewhere else. I just put it on. But did you feel that when we were there? Absolutely. Yeah. We are talking about Museo, and uh, this is uh, one of the places nearby that we uh, had to inspect it uh, a day before. So we have one more question. Uh, hi, Fred. My, my name is Ivan. I, uh, I saw that half of your presentation was about benches is a good uh, thing. And I want to ask you, uh, do you know the main problem in Russia about benches? No. Uh, it's uh, seven months a year you can sit on them because you go to doctor. Uh, they are cold. So, so uh, I personally, uh, a producer of heating benches, the biggest producer in Russia, and made a petition uh, with uh, 800,000 guys that said we want heated benches in Russia and uh, we have success about a uh, dozen of towns uh, are buying because of this petition. So I wanted uh, to ask if it's uh, good for US or Canada, if it's a good idea. We have heated benches with uh, charge devices. I of phones. I think okay. we can discuss marketing ideas a little bit later, but what is the question? Are is, the heat benches it, uh, are popular? A good, a good idea not only for Russia, heat and benches with charger for phones and Wi-Fi, well, okay? We, Kathy is the world expert on benches, and yeah. we probably have 10,000 examples of benches, and we could rate the best. I showed you a few of them but there are clearly top 10 benches that allow for social interaction uh, or comfort. I mean, it's a whole range of the way a bench is used. And then where you locate it. One story we had is that I've always liked is we were doing work up in Canada in a suburban town, uh, and the planner of the town had heard one of our presentations, and he said, I, 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 what I did is I put a bench out on my corner and the community went apoplectic. They were absolutely scared to death of who would sit on that bench. Uh, and so this, happened, this lasted for two or three weeks with a lot of acrimony and all that kind of stuff. And then someone else put a bench out, and that broke the ice. So it's a very bold, in a sense, radical idea to put comfort as a way of embracing people and a bench signals that it's a major, major impact a little bench can have. I'm not sure I asked your question because I didn't quite get all of it. Talk to us afterwards and we can get more. Thank you. We have a little bit more questions. Hello. Actually, a Hi. lot. Well, uh, thank you very much for your uh, well speech, first of all. But um, I have a more well kind of a technical question. What is the technical? How do you technically gather this information from the society who is living in the area? On what changes do they want, and how do they want to actually um, use the space? You talked about that map with uh, dots of three colors. And how do you actually put the, those dots? I mean, you just uh, find people on the streets and give them those dots and put those dots on the map, or you somehow choose those, those people. What, what is the manner? How, how do you know the 
true uh, desires of those people. We had, Thank you. working in Detroit, it was very interesting. The people who were, who were activating Detroit, they came up, their metric, their metric was what you call visual flight rules. Well, when you're flying an airplane, if you're flying visually, you, you don't have instruments, so you're not using any of that. Because all I had to see was if the place was used morning, noon, and night, it was fine, and they went on to the next place. I was really surprised with that answer because these people are very highly technical, but they stopped using technology and data collection for that. But Kathy, you want to? Well, I, I was just going to say that it depends on, like, in, so let's say, think about this area around this building. How would you get input um, from people who live and work in this area? Um, what we would probably, we've only been here like twice, so I don't know what, you know, exactly what I would do, but I mean, you, you know you have there a, a, an organizations that are existing, and you've got to work through them because they have methods of, like social media and different ways of contacting people. A lot of people say in this area, I'm just making this up, but um, people, um, you know, they're not working. So then you have to think, okay, well, how do we reach those people who are working um, but not working here, some, working something else, someplace else? And so you, it's a whole strategy of just figuring out how to reach people and not just a, a general survey. Um, it's not, it's got to be targeted to, through organizations specific places in, in a neighborhood, and then um, using those organizations to try to contact people in the way that they, 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 they can answer uh, legitimately. But you know, one way to get something started is to get 10 people together and do an experiment. And then other people start to get involved uh, because the beginning is very hard. That's the roughest part. But once you've got things going and you start doing, if you were working on 10 places in this district here, you could have a phenomenal impact. It's a really very vibrant district, but it also, there's a lot of weaknesses to it that could be transformative. Cars should not be parking in a lot of the places that are here. Thank you. Have you answered your question? Uh, we have too many people wanted to ask and some of them already have a microphone. Yes, please. Hi. Um, hello. Hi. My name is Anna, and um, you said that it is us, who uh, citizens, who needs to, who should change an environment around us. So I wonder, given your experience, can you please advise us how to uh, unite those active Moscow citizens and communities who wants to change something around us? It's how you identify those people. Is that what you're asking? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Really. Like, and then like attractive okay. to work. Okay. Everything. Everything we do is a fishing expedition. We're looking for those people. The game we're going to do tomorrow with 30 people is a fishing expedition. In those 30 people, there will be five or 10 people that will be the leaders to go to the next level. And that's what, what happens. You just keep, you keep fishing because you're trying to get those passionate people who don't know what they can't do to move forward. And by doing the lighter, quicker, cheaper activations and the, these games, the place game, which we sort of alluded to, Kathy talked a little bit about it, that's the way we get people engaged. And we never, ever fail because people desperately want something in there. We did fail once when someone commanded, com commandeered the, the process. And that's once out of 5,000 times. So people want to do this. They just need to be drawn into it and then they become movers and shakers. I, I think, and I think it gets that back to a, a specific place always because then you can find out what the constituents, constituents 
who, who they are, what they're trying to do, um, because it, 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 it's gonna, not going to be citywide. I know. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Uh, we have a. Можно? Да, мужчина. Hello. Uh, my name is Kirill. I am a deputy of uh, Ostankina District, Moscow. Uh, how do you think? Is it, uh, is it always a good idea to make a public place? I have an example. In our district, the Moscow government made a lot of uh, very attractive public places. But the local residents of our districts are very disappointed with it because it's uh, a lot of people, a lot of noise, a lot of people in our Ostankina Park. The environment in Ostankina Park, it uh, destroys because due to a lot of people. So how do you think what to do with uh, these problems and with, with this conflict? The attractive place to the tourists, to the other residents of the city and the local residents. What to do with conflict with this conflict? Thank you. Yeah. This so, is a very good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So when you're actually creating a citywide place, it's a very different strategy than if you're trying to make a, an intersection in a neighborhood more open and accessible. So you can bring the scale of placemaking right down to a corner. Uh, and, and widen the corner and have seating on that corner. So that's not a, a noisy place. You can go into a, uh, a library and move some of the stuff outside so that there's activity going on, not just in the library, but around it at a very comfortable level. And if it's, to, if it's done by people in that community who have a sense of how they want the feeling of that place to be, they can, they can do wonderful stuff that's in the context of what that place is about. When you get to a larger scale of a city, you'll need more, like the, the, the transit stops around the ring road, uh, those are very much underperforming. And having more multiple use activities there, markets and things, that are real destinations for people in that community would be imme immediately sustainable and, and desirable, but you would, may not have big events there. You may, it may be more of the daily kind of activity that, em that people are embraced because it makes their lives better. So you can go from very big uh, event spaces to a street corner in the different scales fit within that context of who those people are. Okay. We've, never, we've never had that kind of a problem uh, because when you create a place with 10 places in it, they're all smaller scale. They're more intimate type spaces like the one I showed in the market, you know, where they put the bench on top of the tree guard. That was a comfort. It wasn't a noisy, it was a pleasant idea. So you can, at that scale, you actually get your biggest rewards. Have you answered your question? Please. Thank you. We have the youngest, probably one of our uh, listeners. Uh, First, I want to say thank you very much for this talk. And I also wanted to ask you a question. Whether we Вы собираетесь uh, что-то проектировать в Москве и Moscow? Uh, to и возможности использовать вашу формулу 10 плюс? And could you please say a bit more words about your formula 10 plus? Well, we will, we will come back here and work if we can work with you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I was gonna. I was gonna say, when we worked, when we worked in a community. Community. Okay. Anyway, community in Seattle, um, Washington, in the West Coast of the United States, and we had about 
40 people at the meeting and everybody had some ideas, but there was a young man who may be about your age, and he said, okay, um, now, he, st he started to organize everybody and said, okay, let's do it le next Saturday, and I can be the le leader. He couldn't drive or anything, and, he, and they said, so the parks department said, oh, oh no, they're there, he's, He's serious, and he's got all this, the people mobilized to come to plant flowers in the, in the park. And the parks department, well, we didn't know what to do because we're not supposed to plant flowers in the park. <laughs> and and it, was, it was very, he really upset everything, and then they started to plant flowers. And so it's even something like that that can be done very, the next sa Saturday. And there was another wonderful example where in Seattle, she was talking about Austin, Texas, but in Seattle where there was a kids place program where kids would bring their parents down to the downtown and the kids would assess the downtown in terms of whether it was kid friendly or not. And so they were very, very proactive and very definitive about what would make it better for them as children. So you are a superstar, and I want to come and work for you. Thank you. That is quite inspiring. Uh, well, she says thank you. So uh, I'm afraid that on this, okay, one last question. Uh, please, you have a microphone. Hi, my name is Sveta. Thank you very much for a brilliant talk. I have a question about one of the Moscow pains, I think. I live in the suburbs and I work in the suburbs. That's my life now. Have you ever carried out cool, great projects in the suburbs, making them attractive? In Moscow, that's a huge problem because the most beautiful uh, projects are carried out in the city center because our city is huge and you know to get to some of the attractive places we need to commute a lot. Um, do you have any similar projects that were carried out in the suburbs to make them more attractive? So, I'm, I'm thinking, oh sorry, I keep, <laughs> um, I'm thinking about also um, the suburb of Seattle and um, it was a, uh, I met the person who developed this kind of town center in the suburbs. And what he, w he was a developer, a kind of an alternative type de developer. And he was, he started, he rented this shopping center that was, um, was had been unused for a long time. And so he created, um, it's a kind of a, um, public market, bookstore, uh, town center, because the, the town had no center. Um, and it was surrounded by a parking lot and this building, and it's called, um, well, you, you can talk about it a little bit more. Fred would do, wouldn't want to go. Oh, oh, I didn't want to go. We, I, I got in the car and I said, I can't do this. I don't want to go out to the suburbs. I don't want to do this. But this guy was amazing because he took over a whole section of a shopping mall and he turned it into a college and then he had his own stores come in and then the town leaders came into the central gathering place and ran the town, the town meetings from this space. So he turned a failing shopping mall into a town center. Now I think you can do lots in suburban areas. You can uh, layer uses into a school, a library, you can change a uh, hospital, you can change all the buildings to be more multi-use. You can take the main street and bring it down so it's a human scale and that people can walk better. Because usually we've done work all over the, all over the world in small towns. Uh, and the small towns have tremendous potential doing the power of 10. And they will do it. We worked in one small town and we showed them the power of 10. That afternoon, they went out and did a power of 10 exercise in their town and came up with things to do. So it, it's applicable anywhere. It's, and it's open source, it's available, and uh, we wanna see what you do. And just to end, that, that, sorry, the, um, that bookstore market um, town center, it was, a lot of it was uh, staffed by 
um, uh, volunteers, who older people who were running some of the uh, programs, and what's the other? The 2000. And so then there, they had only a two, two or three people staffing this whole shopping center, using the volunteers, and then the uh, woman who was um, kind of in charge of um, kind of asking people if they wanted to be involved or something, she said, her, her um, idea was, you, you never say no. You always say yes. So, and so she had 2,000 events one year, for, because anybody that wanted to do it, I, that she would say yes. So that Thank was you. her strategy, her PR strategy. So you see, what, you. you see why the community is the expert? We don't, we would never have thought that would be possible but she made it possible. So that's how we find these little places and the people who are the zealous nuts are the ones that change. And a lot of them then run for office too. So you're seeing a politics, a local politics around place and community emerging. Thank you. Thank you very much.